just a quick overview of what, what this talk is about. I'm going to try and do all those things. Um, first, well, my name's Dan. And uh, I came up here in 87 with that guy uh, and the space physics program. The rest of this is a cautionary tale for you graduate students. Uh, I, the space physics program wasn't the best lineup for me. I uh, dabbled in education, got my uh, teaching certificate, and uh, became a university employee, and dabbled in local politics, and ran a business for a while, and then kids needed tuition, so I'm back here at the university. Um, uh, in, in, part, in part of that, I decided, well, it's, I, I then found myself at UAF eLearning as an instructional designer. A show of hands, does anyone know what that is? Great, uh, no one ever does. Um, <laughs> an instructional designer works in the, the science, the art and science of, of pedagogy. It tries to help, an instructional designer would try and help an instructor deliver the best class as possible, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. And so I like, well, it's on-the-job training. The School of Ed down, down on campus had a program entirely online in instructional design. So I took it, especially since tuition was free. Um, so my path to a master's, which <laughs> I jumped off the master's train in 87, but I caught back on through the School of Ed. So I started classes, and it's kind of a three-year program. Uh, probably could have been done a lot faster. Uh, and in the School of Ed, I selected a non-thesis project. And I wrapped up at the end of the summer. And Peter was on my committee, thankfully. Uh, uh, then I had a, 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 someone from the School of Ed and another doctorate down there. Um, so what did I learn from the ONID program, the online instructional design. Now, my background was really strong in science, like all the way up you know, to 87. Uh, I cut my teeth on Star Trek and uh, a lot of science fiction, uh, probably not as good math as I, I should have had. But so when I went into the education field, all the research, it's like, you know, OK, well, let's, let's step back and look at what they're studying. People are incredibly complex. And it's not, you, weren't, you don't ever have lab conditions. So a lot of the research is, um, you know, just a slight little variation, and that's considered we found something that is amazing. Uh, a lot of the research is inconclusive and conjecture, and I kind of miss the certainty of science. At least in my mind, that's what I think science is so certain. Um, but there, there's a lot of other, um, in, in current educational research, there's, a, there's, there's some things that I've learned. And one of them is that you know, just because technology allows you to do something doesn't mean that it's a best practice. And you find this a lot in people who are trying to do things in the classroom <laughs> online. Like, what, you know, you got to think about what your goals are, what learning outcomes you want, and so forth. So, Keep this in mind when, you know, just because we can do something, what, you got to think in, like, what is the best outcome? What are you trying to teach in a lab experience? Because I'm going to get back to remote control labs here eventually. Um, you know, what, what's it all about and what are we doing it for? And that kind of goes back with instructional design. Um, so let's talk about what different kind of labs there are. Uh, and I, and I kind of took a stab at, at putting out like a little, maybe a spectrum of, of labs here. These are the ones we're all familiar with. You know, go, uh, used to be in the Duckering lab or whatever, but um, you're there, you're in person, you can see scales, you can measure the brightness of things, measure mass, it's all there. Usually have a lab partner. Usually it's for three hours on a Tuesday or Thursday, sometimes, right? Um, so those are the good things that are there. You also have an instructor or TA that can give you help. So those are all strengths of the, the online lab. I mean, I'm sorry, the hands-on lab. Home labs, I didn't really realize such a thing existed. But especially in distance learning, uh, publishers produce little kits where you can do kitchen chemistry. Uh, 
mixing things in a sink, boiling water, trying to measure things in your home. Um, so there's a variety of kits that kind of like a textbook purchase, uh, students who are studying by themselves just get mailed these things and they follow the instructions and they go ahead and do them. Simulations, uh, they're not, I put it up there because I think some people think about it as a lab, it's not a lab. But it does have some interesting benefits. Uh, a person can do them over and over again. They can explore if it's a good simulation um, and they can experiment uh, widely controlling the variables. If it's put in a really good curriculum, maybe they even wrote this simulation. Um, and it can lead to some, some good findings. AR is augmented reality. And I've seen this in a few uh, journal articles illustrating remote control labs for engineering projects. And what happens is uh, all AR is, I'm sure you've seen examples of apps on your phone and so forth. But in augmented reality, it just puts another layer of information over the real world. So uh, I saw this to affect in engineering labs where students are identifying parts of a circuit board. And if they, they could swipe a screen and they would see parts identifying the chips and all the little gizmos that go on the circuit board. So now we get down to RCLs, remote control laboratories. and. The advantage to these are that many people can use them all around 24-7, uh, as long as there's electricity and a, and a webcam. Uh, so you break out of that three-hour bubble on Tuesdays or Thursdays where people can access the lab. And the only thing you have to really worry about is if someone else, if Peter's using it, I can't get in there. Maybe I could watch what he's doing, but we don't want to fight over the controls and replace one mass with another and go back and forth. So you have to worry about letting someone use it while you're, while you're using it. Other advantages to this is because there's an actual something or other happening, there's, you're going to get real data out of it. And of course, there's going to be real errors. Uh, and because it's real, um, I'll show you a little later, it's, a lot of the research is pointed to students, they're a lot more engaged in it. Because it's real, they want to see what happens if you do it again and again. Um, the answers aren't always the same. So that kind of leads me over to the, the bad things that happen, the, the detractions. Um, Hands-on labs are space limited. Like right now, this, the School of Engineering, um, they funnel in people through their program. And they're really limited to 75 seats, because this one lab has 25 seats in it. The fire marshal says you can't put anyone else in there. There's only three sections. That's it. There can only be 75 people through this program, but yet more students want to take engineering as a discipline. So that, that I mean, it's expensive to build another engineering building. Um, home labs, the, kind of the detractions is, I think, mainly the isolation of the student. They're working alone. They, there's no peer interaction. There's no. Uh, as good as whatever the instructions are. That's their exposure to the science. I couldn't think of any downsides to AR. If you can actually make it happen, that's great. Um, the downsides to RCLs is that they're really complicated to set up. Uh, and usually, uh, usually you want them to be able to be resettable, uh, pull out the the power and plug it back in, and you want it to go back to t equals 0. So they generally have to be really simple. And by that, I mean, like, I think most physics experiments are, are simple, because if you reset everything, it can go back to the initial states very quickly, as opposed to some biology lab where you're growing cultures for weeks. And then all of a sudden, someone opens the door and it freezes while well, your cultures are all dead. And you've just blown three weeks of work. Or I think back to my own chem lab experience where two hours you're trying to do a titration and it goes down the sink. And there goes your grade, too. Um, so RCLs work best in, uh, I think, engineering, uh, electrical engineering, and physics type labs. But I think uh, we're getting to the point where we might be able to get some, some better um, 
better results. Uh, so how did I find out about RCLs? Well, through the program, you know, the ONID program, you have to do these literature reviews, and I was getting, I was getting a little wonky over the inconclusive research <laughs> findings of education until I found this one great article, and it was very inspiring to me. So these guys, Eckert, Grober, and Jodl, they are researchers and, and instructors um, in Germany, and they had the problem that they're trying to teach, they're trying to license um, dentists, and the dentists have to take physics. But these dentists work during the day, or these dental students work during the day. They can't attend a normal university. And so what they set up at the Kaiserslautern Institute of Technology was remote labs, and they said, what are the, the 10 most common, most fundamental concepts we want to give students in the lab? And they created these RCLs that demonstrated these concepts. They allowed students to go in remotely, measure data, do error analysis, do all the things that a student would normally do in a physics lab, except they weren't there. They used their web browser. And they came up after a couple iterations with a set of design principles. And that's them right there. Um, all of those things add into what they considered a, a good lab. If it has these criteria and these attributes, then uh, it's a good design. Um, the second one is, um, that's the one that's most critical. And I think a, a lot of uh, physics instructors that I've talked to, they're worried about the, um, the real lab experience. What is the real lab experience? What do you really want students to, to, take, uh, to take out of the lab? And so this webcam feedback goes to, and it's a real short example, um, you know, computers and a web interface, I could hook up a, uh, a scale and give a student the mass of some metal piece of something or other. And I could give them out to the precision of the instrument. It, it, probably electronically, I could give them 15 digits. And if I gave that to them on a web page, the 15 digits of how many grams something or other was, they would just copy and paste, and they would put that into their lab notebook, and they would learn absolutely nothing. They wouldn't learn anything of the, uh, how the scale worked, what the precision of the instrument means, the error, repeatability, they wouldn't learn anything of that. And so what these guys figured out was, rather than give them a text field that shows what an instrument reads, you take a web camera and you point it at the instrument and you let them manipulate the instrument up and down as closely as possible as you could in a hands-on way. And you let, them, you let them see like a needle that hovers between two numbers, and they have to figure out which one it is. Um, if, you're, if they're measuring current, give them the controls to a, a, a voltmeter and let them figure out that their first couple measurements were on AC instead of DC and that their range was off, and let them get confused and frustrated, just like a, a student in the hands-on lab would be. Some other researchers kind of came up with uh, some similar criteria. And um, so I hope you appreciate this. I'm condensing my entire MED program into these two slides. This is really the best research that I found. Um, of course, there's a lot of stuff there, too, that I, you know, the School of Ed wants us to learn, but I didn't really think it was relevant to this. So I didn't show you all that stuff. Um, so these, these guys, Kajalte, Aiden, Aiden, and Kara, and Alexandru, they really spoke to instructional uh, design, the pedagogy of what you want the student to have in the lab experience. Um, and I'll show you some examples of, of that in a bit. These guys, um, two of them anyway, this points to, uh, there is a comparison to uh, what's the difference between an RCL and a simulation. And this is an important, their, their research showed an important um, behavior in students. They were studying radioactivity. And the simulation 
was uh, they could move blocks around on a screen and it would give them a readout. And however many times I did the, uh, the simulation, the same answer all the time because it was just a computer program and it read some course positional things on a screen and gave them back the, the answer at the same time. Other students did an RCL of a real block of a Mercium and um, a, a Geiger counter and they measured um, stuff. But of course, being a real instrument and a real block that wasn't precisely put in the same space every time and with webcam feedback, their answers varied depending upon what they actually did, their interaction with the equipment. And the, the big finding there was that because things weren't the same, the students were, they had a self-motivation to perform the lab more times. And because it was an RCL, we go into the benefits of having an RCL in the first place. They weren't limited by that three-hour block of time or some impatient lab partner that needs to get to something else. They, they, they could do the lab over and over and over again as much as they wanted to. Uh, and the lab is just always there 24-7. Go do the lab again if you don't, you know, your results aren't the right way or you don't have enough results or whatever. This bit of, um, this bit of advice came um, to me, and it, it's the idea that people really aren't motivated to learn something unless they're going to use it, unless they, you know, I'm not going to read all the instructions to how to put something together until it's Christmas morning and my kids need that thing put together, right? Uh, or until I figure I can't do it without the instructions. Um, but the, and that's when they learn the most, is when you have the need for something, the information becomes so much more relevant. And that relevancy is the thing that makes it stick in your head and, and learn it. it. The relevancy could also be because a test is tomorrow, but that ha doesn't have as many long-term effects as really using something. But the problem with lab science is that they, some, some procedures in a lab, you can't, unless you know it, you can't do it. So you can't do it to find out you don't know it because you don't know it. So you, the, the solution to this in a, a, an RCL, in any kind of like lab resource, is put the information close to where the person is going to need it. So put it on the same website, put it on the same page, put it in the same layout really close to what the, if you have a question in your lab procedure, put the how to do it really close. So the person doesn't have to jump out, load up another uh, browser, open a book, do anything. Just, just make it easy for them to learn. So the whole, with all that information, all that learning that I did through all those credit courses and article reading, I wanted to create a lab condition, an RCL, kind of inspired by the Kaiser Slotten Institute of Technology that would do these things. I wanted students to go through a lab and, and ask through different iterations why their results are different from one time to the other. And you can only do that with, with real equipment. And then if you could get students asking you know, what if I do this instead of that? What if I use a different color laser than a red one? Um, and then asking each other in a class, how, why does one person's results come out one way and another person's come out one, another particular way? And the idea that you are actually operating equipment, and I was excited. I mean, I showed Peter the, the some of the physics labs in, uh, in Germany. And the idea that you're making a little train run around a track in Germany, uh, to me, that was kind of exciting. Um, even if it's in just the other academic building and you're on campus, the idea that you're manipulating something real, I mean, give someone a simple circuit, and the first thing they're going to do is turn the light on, turn the light off. Like, look, I did that. And it's kind of fun. And if you can get students to be motivated to play with it, you've already won part of the game. So, okay, what am I going to do? What RCL lab am I going to do? And, you know, semesters would stretch on, and my, I kept extending my program. And then finally, I went back to the motivation of television, 
and there it was, Cosmos 2.0, and one of the episodes there was called The Electric Boy, and it was all about Michael Faraday and his famous experiment in 1845, which I'm pretty sure I wasn't sleeping. We didn't, I didn't, no one told me about this experiment. It's really important, but that's where uh, in his lab, at the, the Royal Institute, he figured out that light and electricity and magnetism are all tied together. And I, I still don't know why he even thought this was possible, but what he studied became known as the Faraday rotation effect. And see, here I am stepping out on a limb. I actually know this fair enough, <laughs> but I'm stepping into your realm here. Um, but the Faraday rotation effect basically means that the angle of polarization of light that's traveling through a region, and you can't see this that well. This, is, this cylinder here, can you guys all make out that cylinder? That's the region where the magnetic field is applied. Uh, after a given length and the strength of a field, you'll get this angle that rotates through. Um, and it's. I'm still going to stick by this statement. Um, radians per tesla meter, uh, that, uh, that's the Verde constant. That's prob I think that's the coolest uh, set of units there is in the entire universe of physics. Um, so that's the relationship. Uh, if you, we go back to here, the, the longer the space is for uh, the longer the region of magnetized space, the more rotation will occur because there's more chance for it to occur. The stronger the field, the more it will bend, uh, rotate the light. And then the other key principle is the physical property of the substance that it's going through. Uh, and, gen and that's constant, the Verde uh, constant is only constant for a given wavelength of light. Most objects, uh, the shorter the wavelength of the light, the more you go from red to blue, uh, the rotation is more pronounced. And for um, that's true of most objects like glass and rarefied uh, space near neutron stars and most objects. However, it's not true of olive oil. Uh, and one of the things that you have to think about with students is what motivates them. You can use the Faraday rotation effect to study astronomical events, simple optic events. And recently, there were some researchers in um, the Middle East, Iraq, and um, Palestine that were using the Faraday rotation effect to study the quality of virgin olive oil that, you know, uh, it was manufactured in the area. And olive oil has this, I think it's a weird or an interesting property in that um, around 650 nanometers red light, it's pretty strong. And then it dips down. The rotation isn't very pronounced in and, and green. And then it goes back up to blue. So it has like a V shape in terms of how much it will rotate or the, the strength of the Verde constant. Um, so it, it, I think it always pays to try and uh, make, your, make your teaching relevant to students. OK, I think this is where I'm supposed to show you the website. So as part, what is an RCL? What would it actually look like to students? So I created this website. Uh, this was part of my uh, master's project. And Using the design principles of all those guys, uh, I put together a page that mostly dealt with theory. And th here's all the theory. Um, you, it's listed out. And with this, um, uh, what I wanted to do, and I, I basically copied the design from um, modeled after the Kaiser uh RCLs, was I wanted to put everything really kind of close. So this one page that goes, goes down and lists out, whoops, that, that lists out stuff, it's, it's all there available uh, one click 
away. Um, you always want to describe the equipment to students, and I'll just, um, I forgot to mention, uh, sadly, that at this point, I needed equipment. And so um, Peter helped me uh, get in touch with Kurt, and Kurt helped me get in touch with Jeannie Talbot, and uh, they're all very helpful in giving me some lab space. That's up in uh, 253, or the second floor of the Natural Sciences Building. And um, so all I needed here was my 650 nanometer light, uh, an area that was magnetized, um, something to measure the light, and a polarizing filter. And so I wanted to create uh, lab procedures that uh, would allow students to vary the polarizing angle, and they would therefore be able to measure the, if, the amount that the, the light was rotated. Uh, so I give them background on the equipment, in case like the theoretical student would be taking this RCL. Um, I list out procedures. And this is sort of like a model of like what, what the RCL might actually look like. So in this, on this web page, they could, they could click right there, and they would be able to get um, graph paper, print it out at their house, at their library. It's just graph paper. Not too exciting. Um, and I'm, I'm interspersing the, the questions of what they need to do with the procedure to kind of get them thinking along. And there's, there's two kinds of, well, I'm sure there's more than two, but there's two design approaches to, des, uh, to the procedures of a lab. One is procedural. You're, you're trying to reproduce a famous experiment or a physical principle, and you want students to go through linear set of steps and so they learn something. Uh, usually it's why their lab screwed up and why they, you know, they'll never be as good as the old masters. And how could this guy measure the speed of light in 1915 or whatever, and I can't come within 50% of it? Or why, wh whatever. That was my experience in physics labs. I always blamed it on the cheap equipment and never my hands. But um, so. So this procedure is all, all listed there with questions to get them to think along. Um, I guess the other, um, the other approach to a lab is present them a problem. And that's the uh, inquiry-based labs, where you show them the equipment and take care of all the safety concerns. And rather than, and this is where RCLs help, you're not limited to that three-hour block anymore. Maybe instead of having one week to do your lab, you might have two. And you want to make sure students are tracking along. But give them the opportunity to say, or you tell them, I want you to be able to measure something or answer the question, what happens if? And then give them the equipment and let them figure it out. Uh, let them go online. Let them go back to the theory that you provide. Let them actually experiment, iterate things, change parameters, and, and let them discover the uh, the essence of the phenomena themselves. Question: uh, How do you apply a magnetic field? You're sitting at home on a computer, and the equipment is someplace else. Mm -hmm. How do you apply that magnetic field from home? I'll show you. Um, so now we get to the lab, and so this is kind of where you know those like interstate projects of the '70s where they have the big sky ramp, and then all of a sudden, boop, it stops, right? That's my project. It, it's like an on-ramp. Um, so I only carried my project to the point where um, I produced the design and the procedures of what this particular RCL would look like. However, what you would do and what would be the next step in this, this procedure is um, you have, if we go back to the equipment, with the design of, um, With the, with the design, what you would do is you would let students um, turn various things on or off. Uh, you would let them uh, put in a number of uh, amps to throw through the, um, the solenoid. You would let them uh, change the angle of 
of the polarizing filter. Uh, and these things would have a real-time effect on the equipment. And if it was designed well, like the guys at Kaiserslautern had done, when you cranked up this polarizing angle, you would see this rotate. Now, through the magic of hardware interface and some carefully crafted machine shop work, you would be able to do that. Um, so I'll show you what my efforts were on that, that face. But that's the idea, is that you give someone a web interface, and then uh, it would probably be actually a, a better design to let them just change the polarizing angle up and down, and then show them here how far this had rotated. So they'd have to measure that, too. Um, and then you could do things like change the uh, physical object that is inside the solenoid. So whether it's flint glass or olive oil or air, let them, you know, they could probably use air as a control uh, just to see what was up. So I also ran into, when I was doing the, the lab for my project, and um, I, I ran into a factor that um, the object that I was using, olive oil and a special little glass thing called the cuvette, it, um, it only produced about a two degree rotation. And I was running into the fact that the, uh, the power supply was too weak to push more current through the solenoid. The solenoid was um, of such a construction that it was heating up. And it was, uh, <laughs> I think it was not near boiling, but it was causing the olive oil to burp out. And, and so I was having all these real world problems. And um, essentially, though, I discovered two degrees is not enough to give students, I mean, those lines on the polarizer, it's just not enough, and it's not a good educational activity. They wouldn't, they wouldn't learn anything from it. The problem is, is that flint glass, that's the type of glass, it's um, lead is substituted for silicon in the glass. It's actually heavier. It has ornamental properties. Uh, it was called flint glass, I think, because it came from a town in England called Flint. Um, and the story going back to Cosmos 2.0 was that Faraday first forged a, a, a flint glass rod when he was on an internship in Germany. And then when he came back, he kept trying all these materials over and over again to see if there was any rotation. And he finally grabbed his glass rod that he had made in Germany, plopped it in the polarized light, and it rotated significantly. So what this diagram is, uh, after I kind of finished up my work uh, on the master's project, the experimental phase anyway, and the design phase. Uh, fortunately, uh, the College of Natural Sciences, they had a little money left over at the end of last year. And so I suggested that they go talk to these guys. And this is a, um, if you go out to industry and you, you can get these different batches of glass and they have different properties. Um, one of these fields is, uh, chromatic aberration. I forget which access that is. But like when you're making mostly in optics where like eyeglasses or you, you don't want like the red light to come out slower than the blue light or things will look rainbowy and smeary. But if you're using lasers, you don't really care because they're all one wavelength. So I, um, I think it was that sample right there. Um, we were able to get six cylinders, and we have them now, um, and they produce about a 10 degree rotation, which is significant uh, for the student. They'll be able to do that with the equipment we have here at UAF. Um, there's another way, uh, th this thing shows, this is the uh, attached to the vernier equipment. Have it, has anyone, everyone been over to the labs there and seen like they, it's nice equipment. You can hook a variety of instruments to it. This is a photometer and it hooks into the lab computers and it can do all sorts of 
fancy statistical analysis and print graphs, and students can download it on a, a USB thumb drive, et cetera. Um, this is something called Little Bits, and I ordered that over the summer, and it's like modular circuitry you, you uh, plop together. And this one is designed with a light sensor and a crude measurement, uh, just two digits, so it goes from zero to 99. But it would be perfectly sufficient to graph the intensity of the, uh, the light on the end. Um, so the idea, the procedure I would have had students do is um, by, if you were to place a, um, if you were to place a polarizer here, um, you would be able to change the intensity of the light coming out because, um, <laughs> what's it called when light is orthogonal to the polarizer? No, no, no light shows up. Attenuated, yeah. Attenuated, right, that's what I'm <laughs> looking for. So by noticing which way where the light dips down the lowest, you'll, you can create a sine curve and then if you, turn the magnetic field on or off, it just basically takes a whole sign field and shifts it over. So one of the procedures that students could do is take a lot of measurements with and without the field, with a blue laser, with a red laser, with different lengths of something. Uh, and so they could basically play around with uh, magnetic field, length, for day constant, and by measuring, that's the thing that they'll mostly be measuring by the shift in the signing curves, they could determine that stuff and learn about the phenomenon. So after I got the glass, I did try and uh, I was working with Professor Sunwoo Kim down at the School of Engineering, and he has a design, a senior design class uh, in mechanics, and the students come in with some ideas, and um, some of them are looking for ideas, so I was hoping to entrap some of the students into helping me design some of the equipment that would rotate the polarizing angle or change the magnetic field down, like you were wondering. Uh, you know, essentially we needed some equipment to do all these mechanical things, and then there would have been another team that would have worked on the computer interface. The, the professors thought it was a really great idea and appropriate to uh, undergraduate senior level design class. The students didn't think it was appropriate, though, so none of them <laughs> picked it. Um, so it's on hold right now. Um, but I, I still have a desire to work on it. And so the real question is, uh, and so now I, when it, it said on the journal club thing there, Dan Lasota School of Ed, I'm not really with the School of Ed any, anymore. They gave me my little piece of paper and uh, I'm probably not gonna make my family watch me march all the way through that stuff. Um, but I, I'm still an instructional designer, and I'd like to think I'm a science kid at heart. And so I have a real keen interest in working with the physics department, either on this experiment or really anything else, in trying to create an RCL. And, and some of my motivation is that I'm really excited about online learning. We live in a state where many students uh, don't have the opportunity, either their time or distance shifted, or they're living somewhere else. And I think it's the right time that we could create, not go back to the, the cereal box, just because we can. We don't have to take every single lab and make it online. But we could make some. And if we were to do that, we could enhance even the face-to-face -face classes and extend the number of students that we can pull through our university here to a, a, a much larger number. Um, and just because I'm, I'm still on the clock here uh, for <laughs> e-learning, uh, some of the other things that we do down there is we, we advise instructors just on basic uh, instructional philosophy and little tricks and gimmicks you can do to make your class better. So even if we don't jump into RCLs right away, it would be nice to work with uh, physics instructors um, to try and help you make your classes better. So that concludes what I had to say, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions if you have them.
Yeah. Well, it seems like the real hard thing is if you want to pick something up and put it over here, you know, just somehow the, the, the sort of mechanical, electrically driven mechanical interface. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me see. That, that is hard, and it, it, it's difficult to do that. Um, now, the last time I checked, this is one of the required things I had to do for, for the School of Ed. This is the Kaiser Slotten RCL page. And you, it's multilingual, so I'll click British. So I'm pulling up a lab that lets students measure uh, wind velocity and wind resistance based upon the topology of the car. So you can see similarly, everything is kind of placed in, in uh, within easy reach. And so I'm going to hit start experiment. Now, the last time I checked, a number of the RCLs were sadly that looked like someone had come in and jostled stuff, or maybe they lost funding. I don't know what the story was, but they weren't at the state they were in the spring and like in 2012 when I first discovered all this stuff. Um, so I don't know if this will actually work, but here's a similar web interface. I'm going to switch from, um, this also wasn't a factor for me in 1987. Uh, I'll switch from the BMW 6 or coupe to the fire engine. And I'll hit position and see if anything moves. OK. So, so here's, a, here's a, an example of a couple things. The student through the web interface changes a parameter. And I think what the last, since the last time I was here, I think this web camera was bumped. And so it was moved off to the side. You can kind of see that the corner of a fire engine type thing there. Um, I'll switch it over to BMW X5, whatever that is, some kind of sporty thing, I bet. And so they have, how many is it? They have three different kinds of cars. Oh, and there's the corner of it. Just disappeared. Um, so someone, I mean, they're obviously not running this right now to any serious degree, or else some lab assistant would have moved that camera over. But that's the idea, is that you, you change the parameters. You get real-time feedback. And then here's, here's another one of the uh, design principles in action. Let's. Turn the multimeter on. It already looks on to me, but. And let's put the airflow. Let's put it to 50. So if you were to go ahead and read the tasks, uh, the the air blow airflow is blown at 50, whatever that means. Uh, so the student, rather than just given a text readout of the measurement, I think this either is angle or uh, force on a rubber band or something. Um, that you can measure it from from this. It's bouncing around. Yeah, it's not a simulation where bink, there's your answer. <laughs> And if we crank it to 100, which you know you can do, so let's do it. Well, before we had 29 something or others, and now we have 37, so that's good. Um, so when it, it, I forget the specifics of this particular lab, but the idea is that change something, something else in the world, it, it really changes, and so I measure it. Uh, and so just like you would do in a lab. You're, you're measuring things at different points, and you take the data home, and then you do the analysis. Uh, same kind of things, like how do you do a graph? Are your axes labeled? Units, you know, all that stuff can be assessed if the student is doing that when they turn that in online. Um, so all of those things that we care about in physics education, 
it, it can still be used here, but the, the advantage is, is that I'm in Fairbanks and you know, I'm taking an online class in, in Germany. I don't know what town this is in. <laughs> so any, uh, anything else? Any other comments? Oh yeah, absolutely. Look here, something's broken, and so I can't do the lab. And so just like it, it, running a program is going to cost money. You have to have a, a lab assistant to go through and make sure the equipment's in, in working order. Um, depending upon the type of lab, um, you, you also have to teach people how to safely use it. Uh, and in RCLs, that, that's not always a factor. But if you, for instance, like lasers, you know, if you're going to do a laser lab with students, you want to teach them about safety. Don't shine it in your eye, kid. Um, that sort of thing. And so that's, that's not a factor in an RCL, uh, but you still want to teach that safety factor at some point. So that's important. Um, the TA, you know, that's the disadvantage is that you're not there to help the student if something goes wrong. On the other hand, there's, if the equipment was work in good working order, there's only so many things they can do. They can't, they can't like maladjust the fire truck and put it, you know, in an extended position that it might break. So disadvantage, advantage, but you have to think about where it is, you, what it is you're trying to teach. What's the principle you're trying to illustrate? And there's pros and cons to it, um, uh, but that's that's where your design considerations come in. Oh, uh, what hap You have to have some. Um, you have to have. Uh, I'm gonna. Do, I'm just gonna call it collision avoidance software. Basically, if someone, if I'm using it, you can't come in. So it would just <coughs> say it's busy. Um, and this is where you have to think about the number of available resources, i.e., the lab, and how many students, and then like how much time they are given to to do it. So let's say we have a lab. It's due next Tuesday. Uh, so Monday night, everyone's going to be doing the lab, right? <laughs> so you might assign people to different times. Um, I think one of the better designs, or thoughts anyway, was if you have more students in labs, maybe you could duplicate it. And, and if it's busy, just move them over to this lab. Um, the other thing, and it's really important with online education, because you're not in a class with someone, you want to make sure that people are tracking. So there's got to be a lot of instructor presence. Um, there is scheduled. Uh, some labs take the approach of you have to sign up for a particular time, and you can sign that into a calendar resource. But I don't like that approach. I just like going to the lab and doing it. And if you make it simple enough that they can go in quickly in a matter of like four or five minutes, maybe they could go out, take some measurements. And because it's so easily resettable, they could just go back and do it a bit, little bit later. You don't have to take that typical three-hour time and just be there that whole time. You can maybe do it in chunks of five, 10 minutes at a time and come back at your leisure. It depends widely on the lab. Like the, the freezing uh, Petri dishes wouldn't like that very much. But this thing was easy to reset. Yep. Um. One of the most important things that I feel for students is the messing up part in the setup uh -huh. as well. Do you think there's some bridge in the future maybe between this brilliant concept and simulation where you can, you can mix the two? You could have the simulation, you, you set up the lab, you see how it's set up, and then it gives completely bogus results or breaks the equipment because of the setup? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, look, look at, um, what, what was that? Oh, Avatar, right? I mean, you know, some kind of remote 
manipulation of a synthetic thing. I mean, you know, we need more bandwidth for one. Uh, we need better webcams, uh, more tactile feel. I mean, you can't you can't communicate if something's too hot to touch. Just through this interface is too simple for that. Uh, but if that technology shows up, you kind of go back to the question of just because we can, do we want to? So you, you really, I mean, any kind of instruction face to face or online, you really have to think about the most precious commodity you have in a 16 week semester is the time that the students are there. So you really want to get the most out of it. So is it, are you trying to teach them the fragility of the glass, the, the hotness of the substance they're measuring? how easily something is broken, or do you really want to show them a, a physical principle? It might be that one week you give them something that's easily breakable. The next week you give them something that, okay, you've learned that those things break. Now let's just study the phenomena, and you give them something that really can't be messed up. Um, I don't know, lots of approaches there. Hi. Um, have you one thing you might consider is uh, having the sending people a kit Maybe it costs thirty dollars or a little more, and and they can do some experiments, partly with on their, with their hands, while looking at the looking at the uh, on on the screen uh, laboratory experience. Like we might send them something with just simple stuff, like a ruler. Yeah. Um, and then, then you talk to them about well, what's accuracy, what's precision. Mm -hmm. you know, they, then they have a hands-on thing, and, and you can even if you I realize you can't do this with Faraday rotation, but but if you had them build a a little build, make themselves a a uh, solenoid and and uh, run it off a C cell or a D cell, uh -huh. you could get about an amp out of a D cell, and uh, um, so you have it. You have a hands-on kit, so they get their hands dirty, and they have things they can break and screw up, and then you have this, and maybe a combination of two would, uh, would help take care of the uh, dirty hands on, the, mm -hmm. on these. Really do something with your hands involved with this thing. But because so many things nowadays, a lot of things are cheap. I just, it's just amazing. You can, I have a, I have a, a thermometer laser's guy thermometer and uh wood stove type measurement thing what the like measure wood stove stats yes, and yes, stuff that's yeah what i do with it mostly and uh but you know that thing has i mean then you have to talk about accuracy and precision i don't know and and also you didn't you know, if you're studying uh, uh things like emissivity and that sort of thing then you gotta start thinking about well what's the emissivity of this but you but it may be a kit. You can do. You can combine a kit with this, and somehow expand the the experience. I think so. I mean, you, if I was an instructor and I had unlimited funds and time, every every experiment would be mind blowing, and the students would, you know, be so thrilled. And you know, we know that. I mean, students do other things, and so. They don't come to us um, like Michael Faraday, so enthused about the experiment, right? So you, it's really like almost a time management thing. How many resources can you apply to a given situation? You know, your job is to convey information and assess learning on the other end. And uh, it might be that a kitchen home kit is the best way to teach them about precision. Uh, it might be that an RCL is the best way to let them measure radioactivity. You don't have to send radioactive samples all around. In fact, the University of Texas uses that for the National Nuclear Lab. And people from um, the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense and uh, Nuclear Regulatory Agency and the Atomic, the Atomic Watchdog Agency of the UN, I mean, they all they all interact through remote labs uh, to the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so th different labs, and then, hey, let's try a hands-on lab. That's a brilliant idea. I mean, there might be different situations where whatever you're trying to teach uh, kind of leads you to uh, what you're going to, what the activity is.
but yeah, I'm all for kitchen chemistry, kitchen labs in certain uh, circumstances. So an advantage of doing Faraday rotation online is some of the bits and pieces of it are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mention the cost of those glasses. One, so each rod was, uh, oh, the first one was 800 because they manufactured it for us. And the second one was 900. Uh, and once they had the mold, I think, so we have six of them. Uh, and Jeannie has five, and I have one in my office. I still do. It's not broken or anything. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to her. Um, so yeah, that's expensive, and if we were to make an RCL out of it, we could spread that cost around. Um, and so essentially, it's basically free for someone to use, and they're never going to break it um, unless, you know. The robotic screws up. The robot, yeah, the cereal bowl. <laughs> that guy's off the project. <laughs> Well, thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it.